Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this today. Um, this, I believe, is our first ever APAC hours friendly champion office hours, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we actually have a decent number of, of champs in this region for us to host this. So super stoked to be here, super stoked to have you all. Um, as we get started, I'm going to run us through a couple of slides and then we're going to dig into a bunch of questions that we've had people submit in advance. And if there's time as well, um, we'll also be able to field questions live from the audience. So without further ado, um, so we're going to go through some introductions, some house rules, housekeeping, um, talk about a couple of Adobe opportunities that are open at the moment, and then we're going to dig into our Q&As. So to kick us off first, um, just a couple of house rules. To make sure that this is a um, safe and open space for anyone in the marketing nation to learn, to network, and to problem solve. It's problem solve, we're going to ask everyone who is here, please, to follow the following rules. Um, there is going to be no self-promotion or pitch, pitching of any kind at, at this event, and there generally aren't at any user group event. Um, please don't contact people outside of the user group without their consent. If you see people who are in here, don't go stalking people on LinkedIn, please. Um, and if people are sharing a use case in this group, if as we go through questions, people start talking about specific details about problems they're facing, things they're doing in their instance, please don't share that information outside of this group without that person's consent. Um, we want to make sure that people feel comfortable talking about specific details within their instance so that they can get some really helpful specific feedback, but that does rely on everyone recognizing that sometimes some of the things that are shared may be the secretive-ish information that shouldn't be public knowledge. All right, um, this meeting is recorded and it is going to be posted at mugs.marketo.com along with the slides um, and some of the resources that we might talk about today. You will get the recording and you will get the slides via email after this meeting. And this is our panel for today. So we're going to run around the group and do a couple of introductions first. Um, for everyone who's about to intro yourselves, FYI, I'll go top left to right and then bottom left to right. So I will start with off with myself. So hello everybody, if you don't know me, my name is Grace Brebner. I'm the Senior Manager of Client Services for APAC at Digital Pie. Um, I'm a three-time marketer champion, part of the Fearless 50 alum. Um, and I also run a YouTube channel with our other panelists here, Josh Pickles, um, called The Automation Geeks. And that is me in a nutshell, I'll pass over to Phil. Hey everyone, so my name is Phil. I work for a company called The Loomery in Melbourne, Australia, which is basically a marketing technology consultancy and I'm a senior advisor there. I'm a marketer champion as of this year, but uh, newish to all things champ and I've had some great other champs who have helped to lead the way. Uh, I'll pass over to AJ. Hey everyone, it's it's a pleasure meeting you all virtually. Uh, my name is Ajay Sarpal. I'm based out in Bangalore, India. I run my own consulting practice. My The name of my company is Unicorn Martech. And that firm is actually the bronze level partner of Adobe. And I'm three times marketer champion, 2019's fearless marketer, and uh, excited to be a part of this panel discussion. And then we'll pass over to you. Yeah. Sorry, I was talking on mute. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amit Chan. I'm market ID specialist at Atlassian. Uh, my day-to-day -day job is uh, kind of bridging the gap between marketing and IT. So I kind of work as a translator between the technical guy versus non-technical guys. So uh, I'm the one. And then uh, I've been using Marketo uh, from last eight years, and I'm a two times Marketo champion. Happy to be here and answer uh, your questions today. Kia and my name is Josh Pickles. Um, my pronouns are he and him, and I am a two times Marketo champion and work for a organization called Crimson Global Academy, which is New Zealand's first fully virtual online global high school, which has been a very fun and very interesting challenge. So I'm hoping that there'll be a few questions related to education that I can probably help to answer. Perfect. All right, so now that you've met everyone, um, a few quick updates and opportunities for you guys. Um, if you enjoy this champ mug today, um, I know we're 
we're all APAC, we're doing APAC hours today. Um, we do tend to rotate around the Soul Champion community um, and the times of this do change all the time. But you can um, sign up on mugs.maketo.com uh, to become part of the off the champion office hours mug chart basically and get regular updates about when these are happening um if there are champion office hours in future that aren't for your time zone particularly friendly um please still go ahead and register because like for today you'll get the recording out the back of it and there's some really awesome conversations that happen with these on the regular so please do go and sign up but also if you haven't already please go and sign up for any local user groups that are in your area I know not everyone can um, be meeting in person at the moment, but a lot of mugs are doing really awesome things online. And also, actually, it's a really good point to go and make it take advantage of that and sign up for mugs that may not actually be in your local area because so many of them are happen happening online at the moment. You get opportunities to listen to some really awesome people talk about some really awesome things. So get that out of the way. And certifications. Um, so there's been updates to the certification processes recently, um, and they do have new names, which are um, slightly complicated and jargony and difficult to remember. But if you're familiar with the MCE, um, there's a new version of the MCE. The old version is still available. Um, so you can, if you need to get your MCE or you need to recertify, you can go either through the new process or the old process. Um, both will be available. I believe the old one is still available to the end of this year. Um, but there's tons of information for you to go and check that out. Um, as mentioned before, any, any, any topics that we cover today are going to be updated in these slides um, and the slides will be made available after this session is complete. Again, same with any resources that we mention. And I'm going to stop sharing there for a second so we can jump onto this. Um, and the recording will be sent out via email after all of this is done. So. Without further ado, I'm gonna pull up the document that I've got that's got everyone's questions that we got started on. And I'm gonna throw our first question out to Phil. Um, we've got a question from Roshan. Apologies if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Roshan would like to know, how can you go about activating a bunch of different campaigns together when those campaigns are in different programs? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to assume that when you say campaigns, we mean smart campaigns. So uh, the bad news is that it's not really possible, unfortunately. You can see all different smart campaigns that are scheduled and that are going to run and so on within marketing activities from Campaign Inspector, I believe it is. But as far as I know, there's certainly no way to actually bulk activate, deactivate using that interface. So there is a way and it's the API and effectively that's something going to make sense if you need to do this regularly, programmatically, or if you've got hundreds of them and it's something that is going to be worth the time investment to actually get that up and going with the help of probably a development team. So you can do those things via the API to switch smart campaigns on and off, but unfortunately not through the user interface. Cool. Thank you, Phil. Um, and next one came through from Carly. Carly would like to know, what challenges are common for a new learner in marketing automation when it comes to nurture programs and how can you overcome those challenges? I'm going to throw this one out to Josh. Oh, there, I guess when it comes to nurture programs, there are a lot of different types of challenges that are going to be out there that you'll probably encounter. The best piece of advice that I can kind of give here is, um, actually creating a series of documentation that's going to help you to test. Um, this is something that Grace and I have actually spoken about in the Auckland mug before where we've created effectively what we've called like a scenario validation doc that effectively allows you to like map out against a whole bunch of test leads, different scenarios that you expect to happen. So like when a person registers for a something to get added into the program. How does a person exit the program? How does a person maybe move between streams? So you create different scenarios um, with a whole bunch of test leads and then it's just testing, testing, testing and ensuring that the behavior that you are seeing in those activity logs is actually what you've kind of preemptively mapped out in that scenario doc. 
testing is probably the best piece of advice that I can give on that one. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's something that is hugely essential into uh, determining the success of each of those programs on Sarah before you go live. Agree completely. Um, I might open that one up to the wider group as well, because I know that nurture programs are something that gets a lot of people going, especially I think Josh and I, it's something we talk about a lot, but um, RJ, Phil, Amit, is there anything else you want to add on the subject of nurture programs there? Well, yeah, means, you know, the biggest common issue could be that, you know, using transition rules and, you know, uh, many people might not be aware that, you know, we need to use a trigger, a prerequisite to set up the transition rules. And if the transition rules are not set up correctly, then, you know, the leads will not move from one stream to another stream as we expect these to move. So uh, uh, my suggestion here would be that, you know, at times transition rules could be tricky, trickier and then, you know, maybe we may not be able to get all logics in place. So better use smart campaigns to move records from one nurture stream to another one. And there is another thing which I, and, 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 you know, the best practices will completely depending upon the use case to use case, like one client of mine that happens to be a nonprofit organization, they have an, a nurture you know, they have set up an engagement program, which, which is having almost close to 100 default programs that will go through, you know, using different, different streams. So in that way, you know, the logic would be depending upon uh, what we are going to define in the smart campaign of each default program. So depending upon the use case, we will be able to, uh, you know, best advice, but my suggestion would be, you know, instead of using transition rules, use the smart campaigns because it is easier to manage and scale. Yeah. I have to and say I, I do I agree guess, with that. <laughs> yeah. And I guess it will, it will also give you flexibility. Like if you want to exclude a few people um, you know, on the fly, you can just add that exclusion in the smart campaign of those default programs. Right? You will not be able to do that if you are using emails directly on the nurture registry. But if you are using smart campaigns to send out emails, you can do that. So that's another thing that you can do. Yeah, I just say broadly speaking that like if you don't really understand engagement programs and nurture programs well, then definitely do so because that's really the killer feature of Marketo and where you make a lot of your money, to be honest, in marketing operations because that's where the automation truly happens. And if you're doing one-off emails and more one-off emails than spending time improving those nurtures, then definitely try and work out how you can incorporate those one-off emails into something which is a nurture because you get so much more value for your time if you do so. And that's really where a lot of our efforts are often focused. I think the only thing I'd really? clarify on that is just especially for people who are relatively new to my kiddo. Um, obviously, in, in the streams that you're building out, you've got the ability to add in emails, uh, single emails into your stream as content. Something that um, Emmett and Ajay were actually speaking to there was the fact that you can also do what we call nested programs, where you can have a default program and you can add that default program into your actual engagement stream. The benefits of doing something there um, would be that you, as, as the, um, the team were kind of saying, is it means that you've got a little bit more flexibility over determining who can kind of receive specific content using smart campaigns. So if you're triggering, um, if you're using default programs in your email streams, you're able to trigger off a smart campaign, which means that you can start adding exclusions like removing people from specific countries or people who have specific roles, you can kind of exclude them from particular scenes. Yeah, very much so. And if it's, um, Amy, shoot me down if I'm, if I'm being too forward here, but I do know um, one of the past user group conversations Josh and I have had about nurture programs is available on the Automation Geeks YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's topically relevant self-plug. <laughs> um, if you are interested in knowing a little bit more about the step-by-steps on how to go and set up a nurture program, we do have a video from um, a past Auckland user group where Josh and I go step-by-step -step through how to do it. So there's resources there available for you guys to go and dive deeper into subjects like this. Um, moving us along, we've got a, I think I'm going to throw this one to Amit, um, Cecilia wants to know, is there a way to tell 
Marketo not to hyphenate words at line breaks when we're using responsive layouts. That is a problem that has paid me in the past. <laughs> okay. I think it's a simple uh, CSS styling issue. Um, uh, there are uh, property like, uh, you know, word break, uh, break all. Uh, you can use that. I will just post it here. Uh, word break. It's a word break, uh, break word. Let me just type in here. And uh, the thing that you have to do is uh, you have to use this on uh, each local, you know, tags. Like if you are using, uh, you know, TD and then P, then uh, put it on P tag, right? So that will, you know, just uh, put your uh, the complete word in the next line instead of, you know, hyperlinking. So. Um, I mean, I have to say this thing doesn't work in emails. This is, you're not coding for websites. Uh, emails are being seen in different, um, clients and different devices and this may work may work here and there but you can't rely on that 100 percent. it's not really like again this is email not the website uh website is very forgiving very very good with these things uh emails are not very limited <clears throat> okay i had a problem a similar problem with because i'm dealing with asian languages double byte characters right and oh, yeah. i so they they tend not to use spaces between words. They have extremely long words, right? Actually, not long yeah. words. The, the full sentence can be without a space, and that creates lots of problems. So um, I've tried all sorts of things. So yeah, I'm aware of this one. But again, for website, yes. Email, no. <laughs> be very careful. Okay. Test test many times. In you have a good facility in Makero. Um, right, right. Called what the deliverability tool where you can kind of send your send your test sample email to some email address and then you can have a preview as to what that email will look like in different uh, email clients and uh, devices. Yeah, I just posted there a link more... there. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead, Emmett. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I was just saying like there, there is one more property. Uh, it's a uh, uh, break uh, word break uh, break call. Uh, I will try that. <laughs> And I will post that somewhere. But, uh, I think that should work. I, I have encountered this uh, this thing in the past, but I can't really remember. I, I used something, uh, so, some of these, uh, you know, property. I thought uh, it will work, but I will go back and just try it. Yeah, I just posted a link in the chat. So it seems like there's pretty broad support, but there are a few always Outlook <laughs> different clients that don't respect it. So yeah, as usual, I guess just work out what clients are important to you and if you want to make that sacrifice or if you want to code around it and be more verbose. <laughs> yeah, and I think, think, thank you, Boris, for jumping in with that input. I think it's worth highlighting here, kind of like both Phil and Amit have touched on here, email and Boris as well. Email is a special case. Um, as I think any of us who work very closely in email know, it is not as simple as coding for web. Um, there are a lot more variables where things can go wrong, and a lot of those variables come from systems that haven't really been updated since what would seem like the early 80s, quite possibly. Um, so, like kind of, I think, got lightly touched on there, there are a lot of platforms out there that can be wonderful tools to help you with um, figuring out whether you are having display issues like this in your emails too that I have personally used a litmus and email on acid um, mm -hmm. personally I find them absolutely invaluable to use um, but I think as well Phil touched on a point there that I always think is really important to stress with these things is that it's really important to understand what the distribution of different email clients actually is in your database and how that's represented um, it's very it's very difficult sometimes when you're dealing with stakeholders where the stakeholder may be using a 2003 version of Outlook that is only represented by 0.01% of your database and is requiring you to make updates specifically for that client. Um, it's always easier if you have the data on your side where you can prove what the distribution is of different clients in your database so that you can prioritize developments for those specific clients. Um, great conversation there i am yeah, going to move me, us. sorry let me just add one one other thing here i would recommend to people uh, <clears throat> who are new in this uh, area uh, try to keep your email html very clean 
very simple, don't compli complicate things. And um, uh, most importantly, never copy text from uh, Word or Excel or some, some other kind of uh, application which contains uh, yeah. text formatting and just pasting into your email. Always the HTML. Plain, yeah, always paste plain text only. And only once your uh, text is uh, pasted into your email, only do the formatting within your email um, editor in Makero uh, and, and make uh, try to make it simple. Don't, don't complicate things too much. That's a really great advice. What I usually do is, uh, you know, whenever I have this, like uh, the content in Word for Excel, I copy that in a print tax editor, like the notepad. And yes. then uh, copy it from there and put it in marketer editor. Yes, indeed. So yes, you can also try that. Yeah, you can also pass um, paste into the HTML view if you're within the WYSIWYG and yeah. you hit that HTML view button. Pasting into there from Word will prevent any um, prevent most things getting brought across. Not everything, but most. <laughs> Email is a funny world. Um, moving along, I'm going to throw I'm going to throw the next question out into the open, I think, and see if anyone in particular wants to jump in on this one. Julian had a question on anyone who's got tips and best practices for managing multiple workspaces. Uh, sorry, I missed this. Can you read it again, please? Um, Julian had a question about tips and tricks for um, working with workspaces in Marketo. Um, if if none of the other champs want to jump in, I might I might jump in on this one because I've had a, a little bit of experience with workspaces. They are. Um, challenging um, they can be very very useful but they can also create a lot of challenges in your in your instance so I think one of the recommendations I would make is to be very aware and make sure you have a clear understanding of what the limitations of workspaces are specifically when it comes to things like what you can move and clone from one workspace to another there are some things you can and there are some things you can't, and that can make some things challenging. So for example, um, a common scenario I would see would be if you were in a multinational organization where you've got marketing teams potentially across multiple regions, or you may have um, marketing teams across different products or different brands, and you want to control access within your instance and you're thinking about setting up workspaces in that kind of a scenario. Um, but in that kind of scenario, you could have a admin that's sitting at a global level that's working across everything and you wanna have things like program templates to help make sure that things are standardized across all of your workspaces and that people are following standard procedures. Challenges you may find there are um, around cloning things from one workspace to another. If you put your program templates in a worldwide or in a center of excellence workspace, you may find you have challenges cloning things from that to other workspaces. Um, you have to make sure that any of your email templates and landing page templates live in a shared folder within Design Studio that's given accessibility to the other workspaces. Um, uh, forms cannot be cloned across um, and you do find a few interesting scenarios with referencing assets across different workspaces as well so it's important I think to just understand those things and the other thing I would touch on there would be understanding the difference between workspaces and partitions just because you have one does not necessarily mean you have the other and they are two things that people can get confused because they do sometimes go hand in hand, but they also sometimes don't. Um, workspaces are about basically a almost a foldering system in Marketo. Um, it's it's a, prior, a tiered structure of who has access to which stuff and who doesn't from an organizational perspective across the back end of Marketo. Partitions, on the other hand, are splits in your database. Often, if you have workspaces, you will have one workspace is, is, has access to one partition, another workspace has access to another partition, but it is also possible to have multiple workspaces all working off a single shared partition. So it's just important to understand the difference there. Um, but I will hand off to any of the other panelists if they want to jump in on this topic as well. Thanks, Grace. 
Yeah, I don't Julian, think that. hello. About... Did you want to touch in? Hi. Hey. Sorry, this was your question, Julian. <laughs> yeah, it was my question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, with uh, workspaces, I think before kind of scoping it out, it's important to think about your center of excellence, as you've, as you've mentioned, right? So that, I think that's the really important component. This is kind of like, if you think of it as a hub and spoke model, the center of excellence sits right in the middle. And then that kind of allows you to, um, you know, share those assets, even though, you know, some, there are some limitations, but you can basically, you know, use clonable assets, like the, the program templates and so on, so that, um, and then you share that you use that the share folder functionality kind of um, allow allow you know different users to access. So that, yeah, that's kind of how I worked it out until now. But uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think to just add off what everyone's been saying as well. Like, there's definitely scenarios where workspaces and partitions make sense, but sometimes you can just solve that with access. And depending on the level of governance you actually need within that organization, I definitely start with looking at access controls and saying. Well, if we actually stop certain people approving and executing emails, is that a simpler and cleaner solution than going down workspaces or partitions or whatever it might be? Because you can inc you can definitely introduce a lot of complication and it's not always something which is the best when you think about the effort and the potential pitfalls of that. Sure. And another thing that I would add is the naming convention. So if you are using you know, multiple workspaces and uh, uh, you have those different, you know, uh, marketing strategies. So use, uh, you know, a really good naming convention because sometimes what happens is if you are using single uh, lead partition, like if you have different partition for different workspaces, that's fine. But if you're using just one global lead partition for all your workspaces, things might uh, get wrong. Like for example, if you have a smart campaign, which is just saying, hey, if someone fill out, the, uh, fill out a form to this part, so that is smart campaign will run uh, on your whole database. Like uh, it doesn't really matter if that particular contact is from your region or it's a, it's from different people, right? So use this, uh, you know, uh, naming convention and make sure that you are, uh, you know, adding that constraint in, in those kind of things. So that's uh, another thing. Great insight. Thank you guys. I, I do have to agree, I think, especially with Phil, um, if I am completely honest, I don't know that I have seen that many cases where workspaces have been used, where um, it, the problem that workspaces were trying to solve could not have just been solved with permissions and clear processes. Um, and I think especially once we have um, folder level permissions available widely, um, I think we'll find even less so does workspaces become an appropriate solution. Doesn't mean they're never right, um, but I definitely would recommend thinking it through. Like everyone said here, it can create a lot of complexity unnecessarily if you um, go down that pathway without doing your research first. Um, next question I'm gonna throw out um, is from Vidi. Is there a way to translate GUIDs, I'm sure there's a, a word we can use there to, to say that, but GUIDs from CRM to a user-friendly name in Marketo. Munctions are no longer supported by Marketo, so what's the best way to do this? I think I'm going to pass this over to Phil first. Sure. Yeah. So I don't know if it was coincidental, but we saw another question similar to this, I think, in one of the Slack communities. So it's interesting this seems to be coming up. But to, I guess, translate that question even further, what I believe it's getting at is that when you're using Salesforce or Dynamics, whatever it might be, there'll be particularly IDs which will correspond to different objects. So back in previous roles, we had a multi-brand scenario. And each of those brands was set up with a particular ID in Salesforce. So that was effectively what we used to control when a new lead came in. Where is this actually allocated to? <laughs> Linking back, I guess, to our workspace and partitions example before, we decided not to use those when we controlled it via central lead processes. When somebody came in, we'd say, this is this lead or that lead, and here's where it goes based on forms and so on. So the risk that basically this question is getting at is to say, well, we have this 15 character ID that every time a lead needs to be converted or we're allocating it somewhere or using it in some way, even just for querying in a smart list, we have to make sure that that user ID, sorry, that particular ID is correct 
And there's a higher risk that somebody might get that wrong or they'll copy and paste from a different place and so on. So is there a way where I can see what that ID corresponds to in Marketo? And unfortunately the answer is no, but there are a couple of workarounds which we used to use, which might be useful. And the first one is to actually, if you can, define that in a token at the top level folder for a particular brand or wherever you're using that ID. So if you know that, for example, one of your brands is Amazon and you've always got leads coming in from Amazon, Amazon maybe has a folder within Marketo, then you could just have a top level token, a text token, which is saying brand, and that could be that ID. And then every time you're referencing that in a smart campaign flow or in an email or wherever else you need to, it's just referencing that token and it's dictated by the hierarchy. So in that way, you'd actually have fewer opportunities for people to overwrite that and put in incorrect information. And there was another example, which I think might be useful for some people as well, is around smart campaigns. So let's say you have a smart campaign where you're querying off five different IDs and anybody who comes into that smart campaign and looks at the criteria is going to look at that and go, what do those IDs correspond to? Like, what are they? Well, if you're actually saying account ID matches one of these five, you could actually just have a line up the top there that says the five IDs that, are cor that correspond to the things below are one, two, three, four, five. And that could actually just be a line in your smart campaign with, sorry, in your smart list criteria along with those five IDs. So you wouldn't actually need to worry about dictating the one for one at the ID level. You could just basically have a comment up the top of the smart list criteria to say, here's what this means. And then anybody looking at that could wait to see what it is because it actually is looking for any of those values in the smart list criteria, it doesn't matter that that is going to be read by Marketo as saying, oh, I'm going to look for this as well. It would just basically be a translation for other people to use in the future if they ever needed to know what those five IDs were. So long-winded way of saying, unfortunately, no, you can't say this is what that Salesforce ID corresponds to, or this is what this you know, Marketo GUID corresponds to, if I've read the question correctly, but there's some workarounds to try and provide some governance around that. Awesome. Oh, and the second Thank part of that question, actually, I'll finish off the question <laughs> quickly by saying, yeah, they, they spoke about munchions. Munchions is a beta functionality that Marketo brought out in something like 2015, which is where you could actually do some sort of like mathematical comparisons and additions within Marketo fields. It's unfortunately never got out of beta. That's not functionality you can use anymore. So that's what the second half of that question was. And I know that's a fact that makes a lot of people sad. But alas, um, next question we're going to jump into is, I'm going to throw this one out to a Mitt. Um, and I'm going to guess this is from someone who's having a little bit of a tidy up in their instance. Are there any workarounds for bulk moving programs into other folders, Amit? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, I was actually checking the APIs as well, and I could not find any endpoint which can you know, help you out to you know, moving. Uh, you know, camp, for camps from one folder to another folder. Uh, what you can do is uh, you can actually bulk create or clone, but you cannot really move uh, bulk move for camps. So, sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately, I guess on no that one, probably that. the only good news we've got is that drag and drop is back again. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> that makes it slightly easier. <laughs> But unfortunately, no, no, um, no mass moving work around that we're aware of. Um, I'm going to throw this next one out to both Josh and RJ. Let's go to Josh first. Um, measuring success for multiple PPC campaigns. Does it make sense to consolidate everything into a single program? Yes or no? And then probably also explain on the yes or no. Yeah, I, I guess with this one, it really kind of depends on what your reporting outcomes actually are, right? My default or initial response is to say, keep them separate. Um, some people may disagree with that and I can totally understand why they might. Um, the reason I say it might make sense to keep them separate rather than to consolidate is you get better data out of having an individual program for every PPC campaign that you're creating in Marketo, right? Um, if you've got add-ons such as like performance insight, or even if you are just drilling down into some of the generic program reports that Marketo gives us the ability to start reporting on, you can start to see a bit more of the impact that your individual PPC campaigns are actually having 
overall uh, and how they kind of fit into the rest of the your your marketing budgets and strategies um, rather than trying to consolidate them and group them in together at least if they are separate you can actually start to see how individual campaigns are impacting the the conversion rates your flow on into um, mqls sqls all of that kind of stuff so my, my recommendation is generally to keep them individual and I have a different point here because, you know, I'm a loyal advocate of Visible. So Visible happens to be the marketing attribution platform of market to engage product suite. So I would always suggest that you use Visible because it is a scalable platform. First of all, you need not to worry about, uh, you know, whether you need to create different Salesforce campaign or various listener programs, the JavaScript, uh, which we are supposed to add it on uh, every page of our website you know, that takes care of everything. And not just that, it can also give us the attribution based on U-shape, W-shape or full path model. And we can find it out that, you know, which paid social campaign are influencing top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel or middle of the funnel. And we can always find it out which campaign is performing better uh, and, you know, which campaigns are not performing better. We could do that for offline channels as well, but this question is more about paid. The another best, best thing is that all these paid uh, uh, can, uh, all these paid uh, services like Google AdWords, Bing, uh, LinkedIn Legion, these can be natively integrated with Visible. So you need not to do anything. Means you know all these leads will be monitored directly from Visible. Will be pushed back to Salesforce, and you know you can you can actually get the cool insights based on first touch, lead creation, touch, and multi-touch attribution. And it is an amazing tool. So uh, just in case if you, you your marketing team has budget. I would always suggest to go for this tool because you know this will make a life make our life much easier. It is a scalable process, and we need not to think about much about you know tagging everything to respective Salesforce campaign because you know having many listener campaigns is is you know it, it takes a toll uh, even on marketers side as well as on Salesforce. Yeah, I think there's like outside of a visible world as well, there's a potential use case where you might want to simplify things in Marketo, but report more in a more complicated fashion outside. So let's say that you were just passing different UTM parameters through to a form based on different PPC campaigns. I would say, well, if you're not really giving a different experience in Marketo, then as long as you're capturing that information as to the lead source, then you probably could use one campaign in Marketo because you know that whether it's downstream in Salesforce or your BI tool or whatever it is, you're splitting out those different, well, you're able to split out those different lead sources and therefore attribute based on that. So I think there's there's a couple of different scenarios there, but yeah, using something like Visible is definitely preferred within the B2B world, especially. I think the long and short of it is effectively, it depends on your technology landscape. It depends on your reporting requirements. It depends on what other systems you're using and, um, probably also how many stakeholders you need to be keeping happy. And yes, Phil, unfortunately, I feel like much as we love to come here and solve everyone's problems with the wave of a wand, almost every question starts with that. Well, it depends. Um, I'm gonna throw us on to another one now. Um, let's see. Um, I'm gonna throw this one to you as well. Um, cloning an entire folder instead of just a program and trigger programs this is phrased in a way that i'm not entirely sure where the root of the question is but is it can you fold can you clone an entire folder rather than a bunch of individual programs i think might be the question the answer yeah, is no i'm just <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's correct uh, there, there is no uh, you know option available on ui and there is no direct api but uh, there are uh, different APIs that you can use to make that happen. For example, you know you can uh, use create uh, folder uh, to clone that folder, right? And then use uh, you know create asset like for example uh, you know just clone or create the dam uh, uh, API for or to clone the uh, you know individual local assets into that folder. So uh, there is no direct uh, direct way to do it, but uh, you can use the other APIs to make that happen. Awesome, thank you, Amit. Um, next question, I think I'm gonna make it a little bit of an open forum one since I know it applies to every single person on the panelist, but 
I think I'm going to go to RJ first. RJ, tips for becoming a Makito champion? Sure. Uh, well, it is actually a favorite question of mine. And the thing is that the first tip is that you should know Makito and you should have the active MCE certification with you. So uh, in addition to that, you know, you should be the loyal advocate and start sharing your knowledge in Advocate Nation and then, you know, do whatever best that you could do, be a part of user group discussion or try to lead a user group, try to add more content or help in creating more content. And it's all about sharing your success stories or maybe your failures so that other users can 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 make full use of that and it's all about sharing your knowledge with the market market donation and that's how you know uh, th that will help you to get close to market or champion title if everything falls in place awesome thank you rj um any of our other champs want to pitch in as to any particular tips they've got on how you can become a champ yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's. Oh, sorry, yeah, Josh. I I think the 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 one thing um to I mean, if you are very much interested in becoming a a champion, something that um I really did sort of tackle, which is I think key is is involvement, right? And so whether that is getting involved into the Marketo community and you know working with other champions and other users of Marketo to sort of help answer those questions that kind of get delivered there. Um, whether that is writing blog posts across the Marketo sphere, either on the Marketo uh, community or within your own space. Um, that's something that Grace and I pretty much do have done rather than blog posts turn that into a video channel for people. Um, and, and also just getting involved with my kiddo user groups, again, whether that is leading them, whether that is actually speaking at them. Um, I know a, a lot of, there are a couple of Kiwis especially who have been jumping into the international sphere and, and sort of working to working with some of the US mugs actually, um, such as like the, the Dynamics mug to actually speak in a few of those instances there. So I would expect to see a few more uh, APAC faces in the uh, community program in the next couple of years if we keep that up. I would second everything that uh, Josh and uh, Ajay has mentioned. And, uh, you know, you don't really have to go big. You can start with very small things, like as simple as, you know, doing some very small posts on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have some good tips, just post it there, uh, tag market or some, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, some champions there. Just try to build your personal brand from there. I agree completely. If I can chip in, um... A few things I would say is don't expect it to happen quickly. Um, the For most people I know who are champs or who have ever been champs, it's kind of been a multi-year journey to the point that they actually did get to be in a champ class. Um, don't expect it to be something that will happen very quickly and you'll get a ton of rewards for not a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort. Um, one of the key things is definitely consistency. Um, you you do, and it's I think it's probably a question that Josh and I get about the YouTube channel as well. You have to love it. You do have to genuinely enjoy this. You have to be a nerd about it. You have to really care and really enjoy it because we're not here because this is our day job. Um, we do all of this stuff that user groups, um, speaking at webinars, writing blog posts, all of that sort of stuff. For most of us, we do it because we, we are genuinely weirdly obsessed with this stuff. Um, so probably as a flip side to that, don't be intimidated by the champs. Like all of the people on this panel are lovely, lovely human beings. Um, I know the first time I went to Summit was my first year as a champ and I was terrified I was absolutely terrified of meeting all of these people that I'd seen online for years and I was like oh god they're gonna think I'm a little this little weird kiwi in the corner but the the genuine reality is everyone is super lovely um we are all absolute total dorks um and if you come along to if you just are showing your face regularly at events and engaging, um, if you're showing up to user groups, if you are if you are demonstrating an active interest in things, you'll get people's attention and people will want to talk to you because we're nerds and we like nerding out about this stuff and that's kind of why we're here. So um, that would be my roundabout way of saying it's fun. Yay. 
Yeah, I think the world has opened up in terms of visibility of things that we're doing down here in APAC too because of COVID. You know, it's one of the silver linings, I guess, and that you can drop into these mug chats over in San Francisco or in Berlin or wherever you've got the time or the expertise or just want to learn something. So, yeah, take advantage of that. The only other thing I would sort of say is if you are interested in, in becoming a Maikido champion, honestly, as to, to what Grace was sort of saying before, reach out to any one of us and we would be more than happy, I'm sure. I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody here, but I'm sure most of us here would be more than happy to sort of jump on a call, send a few emails, you know, hit you guys up on Slack and actually have some conversations around how we can kind of help get you into the champ program. Because, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I want to see more APAC people in the champ program because we do awesome and amazing stuff down here and I want the, the rest of the world to kind of see all of it. And I have just seen a question in um, the chat about Slack with Josh having touched on that. So there are a lot of Slack groups that you can get involved in um, if you're interested in getting into the community a little bit more. I know one of the major ones is the Mops Pros Slack group. I'm sure Amy will be able to post some information about how you can get access to that Slack group. Um, and there are a couple of other ones floating around as well. Um, I'm sure there's probably some India-based ones. I know we have an ANZ-specific one that is um, largely targeted at anyone who's operating at an MCE level or above. Um, so if you want information about some of those sorts of groups um, and you think you'd get value from them, please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm conscious that we've got about 10 minutes left on the run time of, the time of this. We do still have a couple of questions in the bank, but what I think I might do now is open it up to everyone who is here live in person um, and give people an opportunity to jump into the group, ask a live question, we can talk it through, and if we get radio silence, I'm just going to go back to the list. Hello. I'm going to give it five more seconds. Hey, Pierre, hello. Hi, how you doing? Long time no see. <laughs> nice to see you, Pierre. What's your question? Yeah, um, we were talking about a workspace before. And I know that um, what, what's happening, we're rolling a market all into 160 different countries. So as you can see, it's quite, quite a, um, a big project. But... Um, I was thinking, I've heard, I don't know if you, I'd like to know that, we can dynamically create campaign programs and move them from one workspace to another through API. Is that true? <laughs> and is that possible? <laughs> I'm going to jump in don't and say, I know, you can, I know you can create programs through the API. Yeah. Um, I, I can't speak to moving them, that may be possible. Um, I, the question I would ask is when you say dynamically, what do you mean? Yeah. Through API. So, yeah. But like dy dynamically, like do you mean they need to have dynamic content or? No, 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 via into API. That. So, so, so just yeah. dynamically so as in via the API? Yeah, so there's a, there's a request on, you know, a, a different workspace. So can a uh, set of programs can be picked up and uh, cloned into that workspace via the API? Interesting question. Anyone? Just in my opinion, it, is... it should be... Sorry, Amit, please go ahead. I, I just think, like, I'm just checking the APIs. Um, just trying to see if that is possible. It's okay. I wouldn't have to have the answer now. It's just uh, a question that's been on my mind for a while. Pierre, I can uh, I can help you to answer this, although I don't know the exact answer, but I used a service called Digesto. And what it does that, you know, it actually takes the block program on your instance of Marketo and sends out automatically. So, uh, I strongly feel that, you know, this is certainly doable because, you know, if a program or if a third party tool like Digesto could help us to, you know, create program every day on Marketo, 
or you know whenever we want to and then you know run it based on the schedule and select the template which we are looking for so i see it should be doable but yes we need to have the right uh, api developers in the room who who will be able to program it mm -hmm. so i i personally feel it should be doable because there are tools which are available and which which can help us to somewhat accomplish this so what was the tool you mentioned earlier sorry you, you, it's breaking down Digestro. I'm really sorry. Okay. I'm just typing it for you. That's cool. Uh, it's just the line is just breaking up. Okay, cool. No, that, that's great, guys. Thank you. Um, I'll do some more research, but yeah, I just want to know if someone had a use case, but that's all good. Thank you, Grace. Thanks, Pia. Nice to see you. Been a little while. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Got a got a question they want to jump in with. I'm going to give you the awkward dance as I sit here and shuffle until someone jumps in um, and says everyone. something, I and then I'll stop. Answer. I can <laughs> ask a question. Um, I just nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Um, I am at the moment just trying to work through. We have really basic nurtures in place for kind of pre-trial, we're a SaaS business, so free trial, um, so pre-trial nurtures. Um, but what I'm trying to work through at the moment is um, like topical. How do you, how are people interweaving their topical content? Because with lockdowns and all this stuff like jumping out at us, we front and center that we're creating a lot of really topical content that would supersede kind of what was in a nurture. So I'm trying to work out how we can best sort of splice that into nurture without disrupting it too much. Um, we've sort of touched on it a little bit with um, nested campaigns with the nurture and stuff like that. But um, yeah, if anyone is doing really cool things in that space, um, I'd be keen to learn more. I'll have a go. Um, a couple of things you could consider there. One is if you're running your nurtures on, say, every Wednesday, then you know that any one-off campaigns you can run on a Monday and there's clear space. So that's sort of the mm -hmm. obvious answer. Um, what you could do as well, if you're talking about, let's say, availability of only a week, maybe it's something and there's something happening in, in the world, Australia, New Zealand, wherever it is, and it's only really valid for one or two weeks, you can drop that into the top of the nurture set your custom, let's say, uh, criteria on it to say this goes to certain people. And you can also then say, set availability. I only want this to be available for these two weeks. So you know that after that two weeks, that piece basically goes away and is dead. And you can archive it later to clean up, but you know that it's not going to go out when it's not relevant anymore. Um, that's also one way you could consider if you wanted to keep it all within particular streams, like one view of the nurture. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, good. Anyone else have anything to add on that? I'll yeah. jump in with one thing you can consider as well is if I think I think Phil's ideas are really good. If part of what you want to do is send out a specific email that is that like the focus point of that email is whatever it is that you want to talk about at that given moment. Um, but one of the things that I know I've always had challenges with is how do you insert additional pieces into pre-existing emails without having to go through 300 emails and edit them. Um, and the initial setup of this is not necessarily awesome, but on a long-term basis, um, this is where things like snippets mm. in Marketo can be quite helpful. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, and tokens can also be used in a similar way to a certain extent, um, but snippets are basically bodies of HTML. It's like a, a portion of an email or a portion of a landing page um, that lives in Design Studio and can be referenced by several assets. And you could have this blank snippet or a generic snippet referenced by all of your nurture emails. And it's just got a little banner on it that either has nothing or has some kind of little random, like here's our latest webinar, watch now. Um, but you could go and switch that out once a week. And as, as long as the single point like the snippet or the the token that you use to build that off, whichever way it is that works best for you. Um, as long as that's in one place and is referenced by everywhere else, you can update it in that snippet or update it in that token and everywhere it's referenced, it'll be updated. That can be a, a more time efficient way of getting 
time specific relevant content updated across a lot of assets at once. Yeah, and I guess even further that is a unfortunately quite technical solution. You can do the same thing with velocity email scripts. You can say, I only want this script to show up within a particular time frame. So the script either outputs blank, or if it's within your time period, it outputs whatever you want to say. So then you can override t uh, those different email scripts at different levels and different folders and get really fancy, but that's, yeah, a lot of updates. <laughs> yeah, cool. I was thinking about the snippet solution, but I just, I'm struggling a little bit to get my head around how it could work. Cause yeah, we're kind of wanting, I'm kind of wanting to do it across, like we have a customer newsletter and then we have nurture and then we have like an email going out to our kind of trial recycle buckets and it's all it's relevant for all of them, but we need to tweak it slightly. So yeah. Anyway, maybe I'll um, touch base with some of you guys outside of this. <laughs> yeah. For some and more and info. if you do, if you do end up in a scenario where you need something like that to be slightly different in different circumstances, um, d uh, snippets can be dynamic using dynamic content mm. functionality. Um, so as long as you, as long as the differences you need to make there are differences that are along the lines of a segmentation, um, yeah. then that's one way you can handle that. If it's not along the lines of a segmentation that you need to handle that, then something like Phil mentions with Velocity Script. Um, while it's not always the most user-friendly option, Velocity Script is incredibly powerful. Um, and with slightly more nuanced scenarios like that, sometimes Velocity Script is the more scalable option. Awesome. Thanks, Kai. Cool. All right. Well, I'm conscious that we're at 3.59. We're almost at the top of the hour. Um, so I'll probably let us wrap it up here and just say thank you so much to everyone for coming along. Um, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your questions in advance. Um, it's really awesome to have all of you guys here to have such a great turnout. Thank you very much to our esteemed panel. Um, it's fantastic that we have managed over the last few years to grow the representation in the champion group in the APAC region in particular. It's a, a little thing that excites me quite a lot. Um, so thank you guys for your participation and um, I'm sure you guys, everyone who's joined in, you will get an email out after this that's got the recording and slides and some updated resources. Um, but I'm sure I can speak for the whole panel when I say um, if you have any questions out the back of this, if there's anything we've said that's raised questions or light bulbs in your head, please do feel free to reach out to us. We are, as I said, absolute nerds. We are always happy to chat about anything to do with Marketo. So you can find us on a bunch of different channels. Feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn to ask us questions or on any of the Slack groups that we may be in. If you're a member of it, we'd love to see you. Um, other than that, thank you so much for your time. We'll see you on the next one. And kaki te ano. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks bye -bye. so much, everyone. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.